Well, good evening. And I know it's not Sabbath yet, but happy Sabbath for later on. And um, uh, before we begin our study here, we're going to be reading A.T. Jones, um, the Third Angel's Message from the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. It's going to be the fourth sermon. And uh, um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath that's coming for this past week, uh, for all the blessings, and um, um, for um, the help that you've helped with me and Heidi this week, and uh, we're thankful for um, your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and the people around us. Uh, that you've given us to communicate with and to help. We just give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you can use us in ministering to those around us. And we ask, Lord, that you can be here as we read about the work that you want to do in our hearts, in this world, at the time when everything's crazy. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, after this study, because we'll have more people here, um, you're going to share something, right? So we'll do that at the end. And I don't think we're going to go really long today. I think we can get through quite a bit of this um, uh, fairly quickly. Now, of course, people could just read uh all of these, but as we go through and we talk about what Jones is presenting, we're noticing the things that uh, refer to our time. And we saw that specifically with the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, how um, Jones believed, and Ellen White seemed to support him, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down in their time, and that the Sunday law was imminent. Um, Of course, it never occurred, but we believe that that history was typical of our history. Now, uh, Jones has gone through um, the the political history of what's happening around uh, the Sunday, the enforcement of Sunday. And and now he's going to talk about, and and he's talked about our role in, in this world, right? So he started talking about that yesterday and he's gonna continue that in this study. He says, our lesson closed last night with the example and the action of Christ, which he gave to us when solicited to cross the line, defining the boundary of ambassadorship. We will begin this evening with John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. When Christ was solicited to perform the office of a judge and a divider over men, he refused. Now he says, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And we read in another verse telling what the situation of the Christian is in the world. First John 4 verse 17, as he is, so are we in this world. These verses, however, are only saying in another way, the same truth which we studied last night. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And from the experience which we have heard this evening from Brother Hosler in Switzerland, would it seem to be going too far to take all these scriptures as they read and accept the principle that is involved in them as it there lies? As stated in the present week's Review and Herald, our publishing house was founded in Switzerland for the reason that there was supposed to be the most liberty and that there we would have the most opportunity to do our work for the longest time. Also in the United States, it has been considered that this was the home of liberty. That is true, it was. But now the United States and Switzerland are the two countries where there is more persecution and where more of these evils go on than in Russia itself. Does not not that of itself from the experiences we have heard tonight demonstrate sufficiently as a lesson to us that when we have any connection with these as they appear to us and lean in any respect upon them 
we are leaning on a broken reed. And that the sooner we find that our only refuge, our only confidence is in God and our only allegiance is to his kingdom, to his laws, and to the principles which are there and given, the better off we will be. Now, it's interesting here. So he's saying, if we go back here, um, the, where we said, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And from the experience which we have heard this evening from Brother Hausler in Switzerland, it would seem to be going uh, too far to take all these scriptures as they read and accept the principle that is involved in them as it there lies. So it's a little bit round about what he's saying, but Brother Hostler is giving this report from Switzerland, right? And they've set up a press there in Switzerland, um, I, I suppose to be their European press uh, in the work there in Europe. But he's saying that most of the persecution or the worst persecution is found in Switzerland and the U.S. And, and worse than Russia itself. Now, I don't know particularly these different situations at that time. I mean, this is what Jones is saying. Um, I know Russia is pretty bad, so uh, it's hard to to understand this. I mean, this is obviously before the Russian Revolution. So this is under the uh, the Russian czar, right? Um, but I know there is religious persecution in Russia at this time. I've read Dostoevsky. Um, does not that of itself, from the experience we have heard tonight, demonstrate sufficiently that basically we are need we need to find our refuge, our trust, our confidence, and our allegiance to God in his kingdom, right? That we need to follow his laws and his principles. And that, that's to try to rely on the government. So this is why I find, um, you know, what I call political talk. That is getting riled up about stuff that's happening in politics, whether it's, has to do with COVID, whether it has to do with um, any other thing, censorship or whatever. Um, we're not going to find any refuge and, and our confidence needs to be God, in God, our allegiance with him, not with the kingdoms of this world. So we can, we can say, well, the United States is free or we want the world to be free, but it's not going to be. We're going to be persecuted. So that's just a given in this world. Just a reality. So as it was with Christ, so is it with us in this world. This principle stated in another way is not how near we can conform or connect ourselves with earthly governments and kingdoms, but it is truly how far we can keep away. We are not to see how near we can go without compromising, but how far we can be away to be perfectly safe. That is the principle. The Ten Commandments are prohibitions. One of them says, thou shalt not kill. And in saying that the commandment does not describe to us the line which tells us how near we can go to killing a man without doing it, but in telling us that we shall not kill a man, it tells us that we shall not think a thought which, if carried out to its logical conclusion, could hurt a man at all. In saying thou shalt not commit adultery, he does not tell us just how near we can go to that without doing it, but he tells us that we cannot think on that subject without doing it. Ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause, the revised version leaves out without cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, vain fellow, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. A man goes so far as to think of another that he is a fool and decides the question that he is a fool and then passes the sentence in words, thou fool, has committed murder and the only thing that waits for him is hellfire. But what is the Savior talking about? He is teaching them what it means when it says, thou shalt not kill. And when God said, thou shalt not kill, he forbid 
the thinking of a thought or the speaking of a word, which if carried out to its utmost possible limit, could lead to killing or to doing harm. So if we're thinking ill of our brother, if we're seeking to do him harm in some way, if we're gossiping, right, uh, which is being a cannibal, right, according to the spirit of prophecy, uh, we can see that that is encompassed in the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And then, of course, Jones goes on. He says, ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. So I, I mentioned there about um, that political Jewish pundit guy. I can't think of his name. Is that college. Uh, anyway, he was just saying, you know, that pornography is okay. But we can see that this isn't about just not doing an act. It's about purity of heart. It's about love, right? So if we love our brother, we're not going to wish harm on him. If we love those around us, we wouldn't think and even lust after someone, right? Ha <clears throat> so Jones gone has done it. What? All he did was look and think. That is all. But he has committed adultery so that in forbidding to commit adultery, he forbids to look or thought which, if followed up, could possibly lead to it. The law of God is intended to control the actions by controlling the very spring of the thoughts. That is the principle on which the Bible deals with mankind. And in this principle that we are studying, the separation of religion and the state, God expects us to take our position upon a principle which it is impossible to push by any possible means to a union of church and state or of religion in the state. If we take a position upon that subject, which, if followed, could possibly lead to a union of church and state, then we are wrong. We have not the true principle. If we accept a point or make a statement which, if carried out to its utmost possible bearing, could lead to a union of church and state, then that thing is teaching a union of church and state. And if we, therefore, would be exempt from it, if we would keep clear of it in such a way that our words, our teaching, our proclamation to the world shall be the testimony of God against the beast and his image and the testimony of the truth as it is in Jesus, we are to find a position and hold it, which it is impossible by any sort of dealing to cause to lean toward a union of church and state. Now we have found, you agreed last night, and everyone must agree, that if the principles which lie in these texts, which we read last night, have been followed always by all who name the name of Christ, it would have been impossible for there ever to have been a papacy in the world. And if the principles involved in these texts had been followed by Protestantism from the day that Luther sounded the trumpet of God until now, and should continue so, it would be impossible for there ever to be such a thing as the image of the beast. Now, I think it's interesting here, just um, what does he mean from the day that Luther sounded the trumpet of God until now? But why does he use that expression? Anybody? He was delivering a message. Okay, but yeah, he uses sounding the trumpet of God. I mean, that brings us to the seven trumpets, right? I mean, that could be. Of course, it could be the warning, which are actually the same thing, the warning of the coming judgment, right? The first day of the seventh month. But if we think about the seven trumpets, they are, they are uh, preceding and announcing the coming judgment, October 22, 1844, right? That's the purpose of the seven trumpets. They they are right. the same as the as um, the feast of trumpets, right? Beginning on the first day of the seventh month. So so he's using some language here which we understand, and so we need to take note of this, right? Because this is a symbol here in this history in 1895. 
So, so we shouldn't just pass it by without noticing it. Well, then, we all know that the violation of the principal line in the text, which we read last night, made the papacy. It makes the image of the papacy. And it is impossible for the violation of the principle ever to make anything else. The first step over the line involves all that has ever, that ever has come from the first step that was taken in development of the papacy unto now. So we know that if we violate the principle, you're going to go against the principle. You're not going to be making anything else than the image of the papacy. So the first step over the line involves all that it ever has come. So, so this is an important point that, that Jones has made. Um, in, in setting down this idea, as you see, as he develops it. So using the Ten Commandments as an example, we have to see that we can't even begin down that path. Now, this is going to be relevant later at the 1909 General Conference, where Jones is um, going to make a statement, which we're going to read. Uh, he says, um, there's another verse that we might read in this connection, Mark 12, 29 to 30. When asked which is the first commandment in the law, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. That takes all of man, all the time, to be devoted to God. How much then is there left to wit with which to serve Caesar? Render therefore unto Caesar things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. A little money from the Christian, the levy tribute, belongs to Caesar. The Christian himself belongs to God. How much is God's? By the Christian's recognized right. Of course, all men are God's by creation and by purchase, but the Christian recognizes God's right to him, and it takes a complete surrender to God to be a Christian. To get into that position, a man has to be born again, or else he cannot see the kingdom of God, and that kingdom is not of this world. Then, as certainly as obedience to the commandments of God, calls for all the man to be surrendered to God. So certainly there's none of the man left for the service of Caesar. Look a moment at the verse we have just read. With all thy mind, when that law is fulfilled in me, I want to know how much of my mind I'm going to have left for running politics, for wire pulling in municipal affairs, for working to elect this man or that man, or to see who will nominate me for office or to see what position I can have in the city or in the state. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. But if I divide my mind and put part of it on these things and give the rest to the Lord, what about the double-minded man, unstable in all his ways? Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. No man can serve. You cannot serve God in this world. You cannot serve God and Caesar. As before suggested, this is not saying that the tribute is not to be rendered to Caesar. Christ has commanded that but that it is but a little money which itself is coined and stamped by Caesar. But our service, ourselves, all there is of us belong to God. Christians are subject to the powers that be, but they serve only God. And even this subjection to the powers that be upon the earth is out of conscience toward God. It says so. God must have all the heart. Now, I am talking still on the subject of the beast and his image. And all these movements that have been set before us is the first two lessons which show the standing of the beast and his image as they are in the United States. We are studying the reasons why these things are wrong, which these persons are doing, why it is that the church is interfering in the political workings of the cities and through that of the country and through this proposing to control the nation. We are considering why it is and studying why it is wrong. For as I stated before, it is not enough for us to tell the people that it is wrong. We must show to them that it is wrong and show them by the word that it is wrong, that they may know from God, which is the right, and by that, which is the wrong. 
Now, there is another consideration that we shall study in this connection. In the scriptures, you know that the church is called the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church. We need not take time to turn and read those scriptures. There are so many of them, and you are all familiar with them. Then with the church being the body of Christ and he the head, is not the church practically and indeed literally Christ in the world? But Christ taught, the scriptures teach, a separation of church and state. Christ says, I'm not of this world. This blackboard happens to be standing here, so I will use it. Taking the figure we had last night as between the darkness and the light, this world is darkness, and the rulers of the darkness of this world, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, let that blackboard represent the dark world without this white mark upon it. When Christ came into the world, the light shone in the world. From Galilee there was the word of the prophet, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. Let that white line on the blackboard represent the line between the darkness and the light. On this side is the light. Here is where Christ is. There is still the dark world and the world of darkness. Now he says his kingdom is not of this world. Um, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of light and glory. He is the king there and the kingdom of God is within you. Now, on which side of that line is the church? Wherever Christ is. For we found that he is the church. The church is himself in the world. So then here, in the light, is the church. Here is Christ. Over there in the darkness are the states, the governments that are altogether of this world. No government that ever was on the earth will enter heaven. Now, Christ is separated from them. He refused, absolutely refused, to exercise the office of judging or dividing, to do the thing that pertains and by right to these. Another thing, he had all of these kingdoms of the world offered to him once anyway. Why didn't he accept that offer and thus become the head by gift of all the governments and kingdoms of this world and then manipulate them and by political means regenerate society, redeem cities, reform the mayors, governors, presidents, kings, and emperors, and thus save the world. Why not? That would have only conformed, confirmed the world in eternal ruin. Christ did not accept them. He could not do so. He was offered the government governorship, the possession of all the kingdoms of the world once. He would not have it. But lo, here we find these church leaders in our day actually grasping for it and working to obtain it. If all Christians from the day that of Christ until now had acted in that respect in regard to the kingdoms of the world, in their measure, as Christ did in his, could there have been a papacy? No. Could there have been an image? Impossible. Then where is the place for Christians to stand on that question? Where he stood, refusing to have anything to do with the kingdoms of this world. Now, there is one other consideration we must notice tonight, and that is that these church leaders, these national reformers, are doing all this to regenerate the city, to redeem the state, to save the nation in the interests of the society, of society for the prosperity of kingdoms and nations, and the advancement in civilization. And this, in turn, is to rebound to the prosperity, the glory, and the exaltation of the church. And they say, if this clear-cut line that separates between the church and the state shall be maintained, what will become of civilization? And how is the church to influence the world? That's what they say. Anyway, they argue that the church certainly is in the world to do good to the world in some way. And here are these cities, states, kingdoms, and nations that are corrupt. And the church must have some influence upon them. And if she is to be completely separated from them, how is she to influence them in any way for good? These are the queries that they raise and the arguments which they make. Well, the answer to all that is that by totally separating from them is the only way in which she can ever possibly influence them for good. The church will influence the world. It will influence kingdoms. 
It will influence nations and peoples thereof when and only when it is faithfully the church of Christ and it is not of the world, even as he is not of the world. Then she is not this. When she is not this, she will influence them. That is true. But only by, but only to their undoing. Now, I lay it down as a principle that the aim of Christianity is not to civilize anybody. Christianity aims alone at Christianizing men. And it is better a thousand times to have one Christian savage than to have a whole nation of savage Christians. This appears paradoxical, I admit. Therefore, allow me to explain, for it is correct. The great boast of the papacy is that she is the civilizer of nations, even the mother and the ground and the stay of civilization. Let a papal uh, missionary go into a tribe or nation of savages. He may get the king or the chiefs to accept the Catholic te teaching. He may indeed succeed in getting them to put on clothes and in turning to them to the buildings of houses, fencing fields and tilling the ground, thus turning them into a civilized instead of a savage way of living. And he may even get them to forego warfare, except for their faith. In this sense, they are civilized. And upon this, she calls them all Christians. They are taught to consider themselves Christians. Other heathens and other savages look upon them as Christians and count them so. And so here she has a Christian nation. But as a matter of fact, in essential disposition, they are unchanged in heart. They are still savages, and upon occasion, especially in behalf of the faith, will show themselves absolutely savage. There is abundance of evidence of this, for never was there on the earth more savage savagery, even among savages, than there was for the ages in the Roman Empire in the height of the dominion of the papacy. It is impossible for men to be more, to be more savage than were those... <laughs> Uh, champions of orthodoxy it is so it's impossible for men to be more savage than them and that is what it is i mean by the phrase savage christians now on the other hand let a christian minister or a christian individual go into a nation of savages as they run wild in the forests and present the gospel of jesus christ and the love of god but one of those savages be converted to jesus christ he may still wear his savage clothing or lack of clothing he may not know anything about building a fence or building a house or anything of this kind that is signified in the term civilization. But he is a Christian. The savage is taken out of his heart. Yet as the world goes, as men look at things and as relates to civilization, he would pass only as a savage. But he is a Christian. And in being Christianized in the very nature of things, he is civilized. And as certainly as he continues to live the outward forms of civiliz the outward forms of civilization will appear in due time. That is what I mean by the phrase Christian savage. And that is what I mean when I say that one Christian savage is worth more than a whole nation of these savage Christians. If civilization were the aim and object of Christianity, then there was no place for Christianity in the world where it started and at the time it started. I want you to think of that. Were not the Jews civilized? But if to be counted that the Jews were not up to the proper standard of civilization to suit these national reformers, then let us turn to Greece and Rome. What was the position of Greece and Rome at that time with regard to civilization? They had such a standing in civilization and all that pertains to civilization as that today civilized nations are but copyists of the civilization, the art, the splendor, the laws, the forms of government of the Greeks and Romans. And for that reason, I say that if civilization is the subject of Christianity, if that is, in any sense, the aim of Christianity of, and of Christian work, then there was no place for Christianity in the place and at the time when it started in the world. For there was a stage of civilization that the world has never since reached. But what were the people? They were heathen. And the gospel was sent to those civilized heathen as much as to any savage heathen that was upon the earth. And if there could be any difference, these civilized heathen needed the gospel more than did the savage, savage heathen. Now, as a matter of fact, the gospel will have a great deal to do with civilizing people. 
That is to say, if the gospel which is put in the world solely to Christianize men is used only to civilize men, you will not even civil civilize them. Whereas if that which is put into the world solely to Christianize men shall be used solely for the purpose of Christianizing men, it will both Christianize men and as a consequence, it will civilize them. It is the same old story all the time. If you take the things that God has given for the most supreme purpose that could be mentioned or thought of and use them for another purpose, you will miss the purpose for which you use it. Well, if you will use them solely for the purpose for which God gave them, then you will find that purpose accomplished and you will get all the blessed fruits of that and also all those other things in addition. The Bible is full of illustrations of this principle. But it is all summed up in this word, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all, all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, Christians are not to aim at civilizing men, but solely at Christianizing them. And then the civilizing will take care of itself. Christians are not to seek to civilize men in order to Christianize them. Christian seeks to Christianize people in the order to save them. And I say again, these national reformers in working for what they call the advancement of civilization in the interests of civilization, trying to have the state connect with the church are simply working for the ruin of civilization that is already here. We've seen that worked out in this world. This effort will end only in turning the elements of civility, even as far as they are, into the most savage deviltry in the image of the beast. Now, so we can see what Jones is talking about, I hope, that, that um, if we don't have the gospel, we may look civilized on the outside, but we aren't really civilized in a, in a, in a true Christian sense. And if you think of, well, civilization, I mean, the root there is civil, and we still use that word that somebody's civil, um, though it's kind of weakened a bit. Uh, but somebody is going to act appropriately. Right? We're going to be nice, at least, in that. Point. Then we are never to allow ourselves to be deceived by any such argument as that. Point out the fact and show, by holding steadfast to the straight up and down line, heaven high, between the church and the state, that the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus working in all the world, in the world, by all members of his body, which is the church, for the Christianizing of men, for their salvation. Teach all that with the church devoting all her powers, all her mind and all her strength to that one thing, that she will influence the world and nations and kingdoms. I was going to say infinitely uh, more than she will the other way, but she will not influence them at all the other way for good. In this way, she will influence them only for good, whereas to go a hair's breadth, awry, now the word is awry, right? Awry, that's it. I've pronounced that word wrong for all my life. Anyway, awry, from that only turns the influence which would be for good into nothing but that which is bad. The one is Christ, the other is Antichrist. The work of the church, the aim of Christianity, is not civilization, but salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ alone. So we got through that fairly quickly. That I, mean, I knew it was a shorter one. But let's talk about this, this principle that Jones is presenting. Now, we, we often think of politics in just the sense of world politics, but is there politics that exists in the church? Oh, yeah. yeah. So what is politics? I mean, we know it has to do with policy. And we, we can see it's, it's, it's contradic contradistinction to principle, right? Yes, policy is, yes. Now, when this movement was trying to organize, um, 
they didn't understand what organization was under God, right? What they were trying to do was model, uh, to some degrees, the church, but really the way in which the church models the world, right? So we set up um, a doctrinal, what was it called? No, we had this, like it's our own BRI, the doctoral, um, can't think of what it was called. Um, anybody remember what they call analysis group? That was it. The doctrinal analysis group, I think it was. Now, is there anything wrong with analyzing somebody's article or what somebody's presenting? Well, it depends on for what reasons you're analyzing. Well, the thing is, we do this all the time. But if I was to be the one who decides I'm going to analyze all doctrine, and if it doesn't meet my standards, you can't share it. I do it. Yeah, no, that's that's not the right way. Right. So nothing wrong with having a group studying. You know, they could have had it as a group study papers. Oh, we're going to study these things. You know, Colin proposes, you know, that Trump's going to be a reelected president and you sit down together and study. And you come together to understand the truth by consensus, right? Through studying right. together, through prayer, through interaction with each other. That's Always right. open to the truth and never becoming a pope, never becoming uh, the corrector of heretics. Like I mean, says one, says all. Right. Yeah. So, so that's what this movement did, and and were they political in how they went about doing this? Yeah. Well, if you put a hierarchy, it's going to be political. Well, you know, there is natural hierarchies. There's nothing wrong with a hierarchy. Um, yeah, they were being political. Yes, Heidi, they can't hear you. Yeah, well, policy rather than principle. Well, yes, policy rather than principle and persons in charge rather than truth, Yeah, right? So that's where the politics came in. Yeah, because at the School of the Prophets, when they ran into problems, what they did is they just kept making rules to try to correct the New problem. Policy. Yeah. Where the problem is, one is they are approaching the problems the wrong way because you need to minister to the people that are problems. You need to... Show love and compassion and kindness. But and you need they to. They had arbitrary rules. Yeah. So we saw how people were treated when we were there in 2016 who weren't really very compliant, such as William Pitt. Um, they just made him rebellious, right? And, and we saw this with others. They created what they didn't want. By yeah. Being that way. Yeah. Um, I remember reading testimonies to ministers back in uh, 1987. Um, and in testimonies to ministers, Ellen White, and I can't remember the exact words because this was a long time ago, but she basically says that when you try to control other people and make decisions for them, if you point out somebody as a problem person, you will actually create the problem in that person that you're claiming to try to correct. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I know. And and that that that's not it's not going to help the person. It's not going to help anyone. But when we look at um, this this word antichrist, we we try to save it for you know the pope. But we need to recognize that how we interact with others, that we can have that same spirit that just means in the place of Christ. If I set myself up in the place of Christ to judge other people, to judge what they teach, to say that what they're teaching is error and you should not listen to it, without just simply presenting the truth, allowing you to choose, yeah, then, then I'm the Antichrist, right? So uh, there's a meme on Facebook, something to the effect that you're free to study whatever you want uh, as long as it, it ends up uh, 
you come to the approved um, opinion, right? So, so anything that doesn't lead you to come to the approved opinion, um, and and who decides what the truth is? I mean, even in the church, is the church set up as the arbiter of what is true? Not really. Uh, this has like a, um, you know, you're you got to deal with the college first, and then then it gets disseminated down to the the yeah. other. But the, people. Bible, but the Bible is to be uh, the one that decides what is truth. That's right. Right. But yet we we often set up the church. Now it never used to be that way. I mean, even when when I became an Adventist, nobody would ever have thought. Um, the statement of beliefs was somehow a creed that you had to accept in order to maintain your membership in the church or retain your, your position as, um, you know, a member in good and regular standing. Your behavior, on the other hand, would be another issue, right? I mean, if you're going to be an adulteress or you're going to be a disruptive in, um impolite and backbiting and those those would be reasons to disfellowship on someone but just because somebody holds a view that you don't agree with is not a reason to disfellowship them even if the view is wrong because if people have wrong views it will show up in their behavior eventually correct yeah it's agreeable yeah. So if, if somebody has a wrong view, a wrong view of Christ, and they're stubborn about what they believe, there's no need to try to correct what that person believes. You need to minister to the person because you want that person to be converted. And because the truth can stand on its own. The truth can stand on its own. You don't need to worry about that person right. promoting error because you, you can promote error by trying to stop error from being spread abroad by censuring by criticizing you need to win the man right so you need to minister to them and if you are on the side of right you have nothing to fear now if that person ends up continuing in their uh the heretical belief that's damaging one is they'll probably not want to fellowship with you any longer so there's no need to get rid of them as a heretic they're going to decide on their own but also even if that doesn't happen it will be seen and be manifest in their character and often they just depart from christianity altogether and it's on that basis that you would disfellowship someone not because they believe some wrong ideas and then if you if you are um, not redeeming people and you're not trying to redeem them and redirect them, you're actually their salvation is on you know blood on your hands if you if you actually discourage them, right? Mm -hmm. You're actually doing a disservice to them. Yeah, and I, I saw this happen lots in this movement. So now, I'm not saying that Warburg Church is the perfect example of how to treat people, but one of the things that we did with, with people that were not welcome in other churches, when I moved to Warburg back, you know, uh, whatever it was, 35 years ago, um, there were some people who weren't welcome at other Adventist churches, but they were welcome in Warburg. And we never argued with them, you know, when they wanted to promote their ideas, we would hear what they had to say, but no argument, just to the acceptance of the person as a person. And many, many times the people, two things would happen. Either the person would eventually abandon their heretical ideas, not because they were bullied into it, but because they could eventually see that it was true but it was mostly by how they were treated, not through argument. And if they continued in their heretical ideas, 
they just eventually wouldn't fellowship with us. They would go somewhere else. Because often the reason they believe these heretical ideas is because they want to create controversy. Some people like conflict and controversy. So um, now, of course, Jones here is talking about, to a large degree, you know, what other Christians are doing in connect, connecting with the kingdoms of this world. He's not really particularly talking about Adventists doing that. But Adventists did do it. And they're still doing it today. They want the approval of the world. But we can sometimes think that we are okay ourselves because we don't see ourselves as worldly. But if we act with the same uh, policies, if we're acting with those principles of Satan's kingdom and how we treat one another, we are also antichrist. And so what this movement was setting up, it was interesting when we were there in 2018, uh, they had, and I think actually in 2017 as well, but we had some meetings regarding organization. I think it was maybe 2018 that we had these meetings where Tyler was leading out. And that yeah, was 2018 because they were, the organizational meetings were going on in, uh, in Italy. And so we were having meetings there regarding organization. Do you remember those, dear? I think so. And um, I just shared what I understood from the Bible and spirit of prophecy. And people really liked it, right, without all, you know, Parminder there and stuff. But once Parminder got back, everything that had people had agreed upon, they now completely rejected so, I mean, they were just following Parminder. They could be shown to see sense, but in the end, they were being controlled. This would be like when you, you talk to a Catholic and, you know, it makes sense to them until they go talk to their, their uh, um, priest and they come back, well, you know, this isn't right what you were saying because their priest tells them it wasn't right. So Adventists are not to be like that at all. This movement is not to be like that, right? No one in this movement it should be trying to convince someone through any sort of force or manipulation. Everything that we present should be from God's word. There shouldn't be any uh, attacking of the individual. And we should trust that God can take care of his truth. Even if people believe some things that are not correct, it's not our responsibility to correct them through force or through manipula manipulation or through the power of an org organization or a movement. And that's hard for some people to take because some people think, well, the person's teaching error and, you know, they must be stopped. But there is a way to stop them. It's just through the proclamation of the truth. So anyway, it was a fairly short study, very short reading here. But um, any any other thoughts on this? Is this the last of Jones' letters here? No, he's going to keep. Mm -hmm. uh, this okay. is um, next week is number five of the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. So we're on page 483 of this document, and there is uh, like 900, almost a thousand pages. Yeah, so we're, we're we're just about halfway. Okay, right. Because, um, yeah, 493 times 2 is, um, yeah, that's going to give you, um, just, yeah, we just passed halfway while reading this article. Right, so. so it's a lot of material that Jones has here. Now, some of it we're not going to look at um, that's in this document, uh, just because it's, it's repetitious. Um, 
but we are going to look at his 1909 uh, appeal for evangelical Christianity, which is um, a few days later, Ellen White, in commenting on what Jones said, is that disorganization is the, in the very air we breathe. So one is we're going to see how far Jones goes, how far he's pushed out by those that oppose him and the mistakes that he's made. He did make mistakes, that's for sure. Does but, he, uh, uh, what's that? Does he talk about the stuff like the 1919 Bible Conference? And no, because no. he's Adventism before then. Uh, okay, yeah, he, he's, okay. he's, I think it's 1907 that he's removed. Yeah, okay, Something like that. But he does do an appeal for evangelical Christianity in the 1909. Uh, general conference so he's gonna make an appeal there but um but what he's presenting in the 1895 general conference bulletin is sound right so there's there's not problems with it but there are seeds of ideas that later jones does because of opposition and because of his discouragement with the direction the church is going that drives him further away. And a lot of it has to do with Kellogg and Wagner and uh, all the political stuff that was going on at the time. So, so Jones gets discouraged by the whole thing. Um, any, any other thoughts or questions, comments? Okay, so I guess we can close with prayer, and then Heidi's going to give a bit of a testimony. So let's, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening. We pray that you can bless each person. We pray for Dwight's presentation tomorrow morning and uh, the study by Daniel Fontenot and um, the other studies on Sunday. We just ask, Lord, that uh, you can bless each person who is searching for truth, that you can guide them. Um, be with us throughout this Sabbath, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.